Welcome to the Fargo Podcast, the officially unofficial podcast for Fargo on FX. I'm Jim. I'm Aaron. And today we're talking Season 5, Episode 9, The Useless Hand. Aaron, how are you feeling about this episode? I, I think I've learned to stop worrying and love the Fargo. I I I really I I've I've been on a roll of liking the episodes. I really like this episode. This is the first time where like some of the humor, the poking fun at Roy, like really got to me. Um, like when they cut from Roy saying they're gonna find these Huns are gonna find out what it means when Patriots sing the song of victory, whatever, and it smash cuts to all of the Patriots arriving to the YMCA. YMCA. <laughs> I, I actually got a belly laugh out of me. The way a lot of the nipple rings and herder, he's got a, a you know sexual fixation with his uh, you know wife and handcuffing liberals and shit like that. I'm not sure why that attempts at lampooning haven't landed as well. But they they did all landed this year. Maybe it's because it's clear that he's going to get his this uh, you know everything's kind of arrayed against him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked it. Um, a, a good, effective uh, whiteout snow conditions in Fargo again. Uh, I they they finally made me feel kind of sorry for Gator. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, uh, old, old Munch ate and left no crumbs. I think is what the kids say. Uh, <laughs> okay. With a name like Munch, you you, you kind of expect it. Uh, what do you think? Mm-hmm. Coming, uh, coming back from your, coming back from your illness. Welcome back, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be back. Um, boy, this is not fun. I, I was not able to watch Fargo while I was sick. I had to wait until after I recovered a little bit because, woo, it was rough. Um, yeah, what do you think? Because you, you, this is your. You, you, um, there's three episodes that you kind of are going into. What, what did you make of this uh, trio? Um, I really enjoyed the it was episode seven yeah i think it was episode seven it's the puppety one uh-huh i i, I found myself really like I, I was totally uncertain about it at first sure yeah uh, while i was watching it and then we get to the puppet show and i'm like okay okay this is cool this is working for me but then they did the thing you know they did the thing right where they the say hey all of this was just in her head uh, she wakes up in front of the pancakes again, and I'm like, "Oh God, oh God!" Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know. I found myself enjoying that ride at some point. Um, but s- someone does need to tell Holly, "Look, you just can't do this. This is illegal. This is illegal storytelling this, at this point." This is 2024, man. We're we're yeah. sitting here watching the show. You can't, you can't, you can't pull that with us. That was 2023, though. So last. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah, the last year. He got in under the wire. The it's just a dream expired actually December mm-hmm. twenty uh, December thirty uh, first two thousand twenty three, and then I I think it, well, I'm a little puzzled by what it all meant uh, for Dot, but I I think I'm getting to it with this episode. I think I'm understanding a little bit more. But it's kind of everything he's doing. I guess with Dot seems to be a little confusing to me. Um, mm-hmm specifically the dot Lorraine stuff. I'm not certain what I'm supposed to understand about that relationship after this episode. It's different to what I thought it was. Um, I, I never felt like dot was seeking any kind of approval from Lorraine at all. And yet here we are in an episode where she tears up hearing her call her daughter for the first time. And I'm like, that comes out of nowhere for me. Nowhere. Because uh, I thought it they might were come out of huge antagonists. For, it might come out of nowhere for Dot, too, you know? It's possible, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about it when we get there. But uh, I found myself really enjoying just kind of the ride of Fargo over the last couple of episodes. And I, I don't know if I'm just, like, a little out of step with the bigger things that this show is doing. And so when I can step out of the sort of critic role and just enjoy the show, it becomes more enjoyable for me um or what but i found myself not quite enjoying this episode as much Hmm. it's probably because i'm looking through it at at it through a certain lens um but there were definitely moments um for me the ymca thing was interesting was it so, so i'm also a little confused on because i watched these things like back to back to back um I'm a little confused on what happened in what episode was this the episode with the wonder where john ham walks to the barn because no, I thought that was the previous episode. Uh, okay, I really enjoyed that one. 
Um, that shot was very good. Yeah, that was impressive. Uh, this episode, yeah, I I mean the the stuff with Danish that that you know happened last episode, I thought it made a lot of sense um, to me, and I really enjoyed that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, incredible I, flourish for his character too. I thought I, I, I do. I do wish they had given us more of that. Like you, you know, you talk about the the election stuff and how they're really kind of sticking it to Roy in these episodes. I I wish there was more of that. I I wish there. I wish we had seen Danish almost as I was getting like Better Call Saul kind of vibes throughout that whole uh, yeah. sequence. Mm-hmm. And it, I was really, really enjoying it. And I thought, like, if Danish is going to go out this episode, I wish this was the plan that didn't work. And it is the plan that doesn't work, but it's the first plan. And I wish the, I wish we had seen more of him succeeding and, and why he's, like, this smooth operator. Like, mm. you don't want to see Jimmy fail on his first uh, heist or his first con, right? right you want to see him right. succeed and, and see why he's really kind of a shit. And I want to see Danish Graves do these horrible things and succeed and get away with them and then have him go one step too far. Have him step into the ring with the wrong person and get get his. But like Yeah. It'd be like if But Tuco he gets his immediate murdered. Tuco murders Jimmy in the first episode of Better Call Saul. Like he has like he, he <laughs> Right. He gets one over on Tuco, he just shows up, blows him away. Well fuck you, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like well I the Danish the Danish Graves show ended as it just got started. Right, right. And I do wish we had seen earlier in the season him do, wielding his powers a little more successfully. Um, yeah. And, and and as entertainingly, because, like, we do see him, you know, making phone calls, and he's clearly doing things behind the scenes, but sure, it's not entertaining. It's just yeah. it is what it is. Uh, this was really entertaining. I mean, that, yeah. that scene with the multiple Roys is <laughs> fantastic. And him busting out. Uh, that door the double doors with the the kind of mr wrench and numbers soundtrack was was pretty mm-hmm. sweet mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh and, and then you know like i said this episode is it's much more contained, i was gonna say what right? yeah what about this episode kind of was a downshift from the previous two in your estimation well it's all pretty much taking place in this one location um and uh, it's it's doing things that are a little more thematic um and I don't know that I'm always picking up what this show is putting down this season. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, there were some unexpected turns with characters that uh, surprised me in the moment. And I still am not totally sure how I feel about them. But okay, uh, yeah, it, 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 was, it was just a lot murkier, I guess, than the last couple of episodes. Certainly could... in filmmaking terms, because like I said, the whiteout conditions uh-huh. yeah. was made things very murky indeed. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I, we'll we'll talk about it as we kind of get to these things. But yeah, I, I was not feeling it as much as the last two episodes could be. Like I said, because I had to put my critic hat back on and start mm. really thinking about them instead of enjoying them. It is easier to love things you don't have to watch two or three times and talk for a couple hours about. You know, absolutely it yeah. is it's a lot easier just uncritically love let things, let the sure. let the kind of shaky things go and really just yeah. settle into the things that are working and not have to think is this working just feel yeah. is it is it working yeah it is yeah yeah i i it, it is tough sometimes anyway um maybe we should just get into it and start talking about the episode let's do it all right we start off with uh old munch he's got gator out on a lake in a nice fishing shack and gator's bargaining for his freedom with munch but munch is only interested in plucking out his eyes as payment for the old woman's life i love gator's conception of what a man could possibly want in exchange for his freedom (laughs) he's like do you want drugs i keep you high for 10 years i got a cvs in the back uh, evidence room do you want guns do you want armor you want titties i got i got everything a man needs yeah and it's like remind yeah i mean it's this guy who it, it's a guy who thinks he understands the world and how things works and his his place in it and you know there's old bunch there to wreck to, to remind him you have no fucking clue there, there, there are 
yeah, there there are things that people could desire and motivations that are beyond anything you've ever considered because or, or your like life experience bedrock, is so narrow. Bedrock principles. Uh-huh. Like the Tillmans don't have those. They talk about them, but Roy would sacrifice any number one of his his, his friends, his principles uh, to further his own interests. They are just things that they say to justify the actions that they want to do. And uh, here's a guy, here is like, you know, old lunch is like, I think literally kind of a force of nature. Um, like the embodiment of, of, of justice and balancing the scales. And uh, mm -hmm. he's offended. He's offended bunch. Like he, I, I, and I love, I love the way he talks like Jack and Hagar, that whole, you know, an old woman watches young men play a game and uh, a rabbit screams because it doesn't because it's caught and it knows only what it wants that it wants to live i love that like stilted delivery that he has it's mm -hmm. it's it brings it, something it's very otherworldly to, to yeah the world. yeah and i do wonder if they're ever going to i i i kind of uh, at this point kind of hope they let the mystery be like is old munch a long line lo uh, the, the the last descendant of a long line of munchers is he literally a 500 year old Welshman that eats sins? Is he supernatural? Is Dot supernatural? I, I kind of, the more the season has gone on with only one episode to go, I, I kind of hope they just let that kind of be weird. Fargo I feel like weird. they're going to. I, I think we've seen the last of Munch. Munch walks off yeah. into the mist here, I think. That's it. That's all we've got for him. It'd be interesting to, to argue the utility of like showing because like usually Fargo and the supernatural stuff comes out as late in the season and you kind of have a good idea of how you feel about the season. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what Holly's doing. He's like, hey, I've been doing this for five seasons now. Uh, I hit him with a vengeful ghost last season. Uh, I can do whatever I want. You know, if people are still watching the show. They're going to be. Um, and that, that might be the smart play. You know, because again, like if I'm watching this as a fan and not as a podcaster, who's like, it's like reading a book and every chapter you stop and discuss whether the book sucks or not, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whereas even in the chapters the that are set up and, and uh, right to other things. Yeah. Right. Right. Nothing's happening because it's not the climax yet. Um, I, uh, I, I, like I said, I don't know that's a bad call, but I understand why we got, you know, like, oh my God, what is this going to, because like if they're hitting us this early, is it just going to be all a bunch of things that go bump in the night. Um, we were supposed to have a fun, funny nope. f um, Fargo uh, raising Arizona. It wasn't that either. Styles. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was neither of those things, right? He didn't go super far in that supernatural direction, but also it was not the romp I was promised. Yeah. yeah. So um, now that uh, I, I see kind of the shape of the season, I'm, I'm appreciating. And I, I do think that Munch is a really great character. Mm-hmm. Um, he saw it's, it's another one of these unforgettable, you know, you throw him right up with, uh, Billy Bob Thornton's, uh, Lauren Malvo, you throw him up with, um, uh, David Thewlis's, what the, was that guy's, uh, Varga? Yeah. VM Varga. I mean, Fargo of nothing else has given us extraordinarily memorable villains, like Absolutely. archetypal Jungian villains. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh... I was wondering how likely you are to have your eyes plucked out and survive. Pretty, feels like, I think it you're feels pretty like likely. Pretty, yeah. Especially if it's a hot knife that's cauterizing yeah. those uh, eye veins. Plus, I think your eyeballs are kind of like a self-contained unit, you know? Like, uh-huh. There's not a lot of... In fact, I, I, I read something um, a couple of months ago that in... And I, I didn't... Because it's one of those things where it's like, oh, that's an interesting fact. And I, I didn't care enough about it to, to look at it. But they... Someone said that, like, your immune system, if it ever finds out about your eyes, destroys them instantly. Like, something about <laughs> your, your eyes are like a foreign cell or something. I don't know. But uh, that it seems like that's... It's, it's just, just right. from... It seems like cutting out people's tongues and gouging out their eyes was pretty common non-lethal punishments back in the old days. So yeah, anything you can get um, away with in the 1400s, yeah, <laughs> medically, I think we're yeah. cool uh, to do it on an ice lake here. I do think it's it's interesting to see the moment Gator goes from confident that he's like, look, I'm you know this guy's not doing this just for some no reason. He's pissed off because I took the money back, and we can all. 
you know, we can we can still make a deal. And when he realizes that there's he's not talking his ass out of this pit. Um, mm -hmm. I also thought it was really slick. And, and, and I, I, you know, Holly being who he is, I'm pretty sure it's intentional that right as, you know, Munch is gouging his eyes and he's screaming, they kind of dissolve and this uh, jazz, this, this blue song comes up where the guy says, I was a wanderer. I had sorrow. I heard the gospel <laughs> story. I thought it's funny that like, it's another play on eyes. His eyes are wandering. They're leaving his skull. His eyes are having some sorrow. His eyes are hearing the gospel story because he's literally quoting the Bible to him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand the gospels are not the Bible. It's contained in the Bible, but it's not the Bible. But still, like I mm -hmm. thought, it's it's c clearly this is I think Holly amusing himself at Gator's eyes singing the blues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's even a turn of phrase within the dialogue here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yes, I. Uh huh. Exactly. Um, and the music in this episode is very good as well. Uh, it sure is. I mean, look, I'm a fan of classic rock. The classic rock that was classic rock in the '90s. Also, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Look, classic mm -hmm. rock has changed. Yeah, Everything we're I grew up now, with now. Jim. <laughs> yeah, is is classic rock. But th this whipping post song that they do at the end of this episode, God, I love that mm -hmm. song. That is just a yeah. classic blues rock anthem. So good. Um, then they did. They also do a riff on Toxic, uh, that Britney Spears song, which I, oh yeah, that I, was, I don't know that's... if that's totally appropriate because the song the song is about a lover who's bad for you. It's not like <laughs> I don't I don't know exactly what they're doing with it. I I think it works both ways. It works because Roy is a toxic male, uh, or showing toxic masculinity makes you a toxic male. But it also sure. is is they're they're also making a point that she's bad for Roy too. Mm -hmm. Like multiple yeah. people, from his new wife Karen to his father in law Odin to his ranch hands to his son of uh, to, to old munch himself have said this is crazy what you're doing and he realizes like three episodes too late i think this episode that yeah you guys are right i think i yeah. think it worked there's some really cool drum tracks they use in one of these episodes i i don't know the music in the show is quite good yeah anyway uh let's go back to roy's ranch where dot is still trying to escape her pri prison shack uh while reaching for the ceiling she falls through the floor which gives her the idea to escape from below, or at least hide there. Um, and Roy hasn't heard from Gator, and he thinks, oh boy, the tide's turned on him. So he calls Odin and his militia to dig in and tells Bowman to go bury Dot. Yeah, I couldn't help but remember. There's um, my favorite uh, book series of all time, Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Maturin series, the uh, Master and Commander uh, movie is based on that. Uh, there's something late in the series where, you know, uh, Lucky Jack, the captain, is getting old. He's an admiral. I think he's a rear admiral at this point. And he's reflecting with his friend Stephen about his life and what an improbable run of luck it's being. And things are starting to reverse against him. And he says, like, I can feel it. It's like the turn of the tide. You know, I've had, like, my whole life the tide has been coming in. And now it's starting to recede. And I think it's such a powerful metaphor. And Roy, it's like, you know, like, you think of the things, like, he's standing on this, like, you know, long-spanning legacy of lawmen good bad or ugly in stark county and you know he must have thought in, he's invincible when he's stealing millions of dollars and giving it to the militia and they're, they're they're getting high in their own supply and you know there's this national movement of constitutional sheriffs and you know nothing can stop him not even the might of the federal government because we're on our and and now the tide's coming out uh, i i like it and and uh he's preparing himself and his followers to die here i do wonder how much of this is posturing and how much of it is sincere mm -hmm. because it's all well and good to be like oh, I'm ready to die for my bullet but then when you know the fbi rolls up in their tanks and it's because because that's the thing it's like when i was coming of age you had genuine crazy white right wingers you know uh waco ruby ridge people that mm -hmm. were really well you know thought they were jesus christ thought they were sebastians and they were re ready and willing to die I feel like a lot of guys nowadays that are doing this shit are just they're just like hoping that a bunch of guys with guns will 
make people go away and leave them alone. They're not about that life. Mm. They're not really having apocalyptic visions of the future. It's essentially, you know, when you see these people posing on social media with their guns and all that stuff looking tough and saying, come and get them and whatnot. That's, I always think that's such a, that's such a posing. They're just posing. They're just trying to sell black rifle coffee and, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't post on social media of... pictures of you doing that if you weren't posing, right? That is posing. That's literally what it is. It's literally being a poser, yeah. 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 I mean, you can't... <laughs> Look, people people who really, truly believe that stuff don't need to get on po- social media and post about it. They'd rather right. just, you know, stay off Subvert that radar. Government. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, like, I, yeah it's, it's all... I mean, everything on social media is posturing and posing. And, yeah. Because like, you're doing it for an audience. It's by definition I, posing. I, I don't know if Roy, if that's if if that if that accurately describes him. Is he one of those posers? Or is he one of those kind of well, like true believers? There's two questions I have here about Roy, um, and that's one of them. Uh, and I think the episode kind of shades it a little bit in favor of hey, he's a little bit of a poser here because mm-hmm. what he does with this tunnel. You know, he leaves himself an out. He he talks a huge game to the FBI to their faces and says, "You know what? I'm I'm ready to die here, and if and, and so be it if that happens." And then he goes and he opens himself an escape hatch. Uh, yeah. So Eggs. there you so, go. So, so the, his actions are betraying his his words here, and I think that to me says he's a bit of a poser. The other he's he's referring this he's when he says this is our Masada. I'm like, huh? I've never heard that reference. This mm-hmm. is a fortress mesa in southern israel that is a very impressive like it's like the, it, it it looks like uh something like helm's deep you know it's just this, wow. this stone column with the ruins of a wall around it and i guess in the early first century the king herod that ruled judea at the time started fortifying that and put palaces up there and by 70 ce when the jewish zealots were trying to rebel against the roman empire i guess one of the big factions they met there this was kind of their waterloo and legend says that like a thousand of them committed suicide on top of that fortification rather than being taken alive by the romans so roy is absolutely saying this is where we either win or die mm-hmm but then he cracks the door open for himself, just in case. Right. Because I, 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 I was with you. I think that tunnel leads off property, and he's, you know. I, I see. So. Yeah. I mean, where does the tunnel go? I, I don't. Know. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's his bunker, and he's just gonna, you know. But but saying no, I just think it's in one of those Lalo means... tunnels from Better Call Saul. Yeah. It's, it's a bug out bug out tunnel. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I also have questions about this. Uh, the the windmill. So this is connected to the process, right? The, the, if you go back to the doll episode, um, this windmill in Dot's mind is connected to the process. Like you've got to go through this thing to experience it and feel it and understand it. Um, even if it seems dumb at the time, you've got, you've got to just go through the process and it'll make sense. Yeah. Why does she flash to that in this moment? I, I really don't um, understand this part of the in, episode. In what moment? Um, she's trying to escape her prison shack. She's looking out there and like seeing this windmill and flashing back to her vision that never actually happened. Does she do? Because I thought I thought she only flashed back when. Uh, wait, where? Yeah, what flashback? Because I I remember clearly when Indira tells her to get to some place where no one will think to look. She has that kind of like subliminal flash mm-hmm. to the windmill. Totally. Are they, does that happen in this scene too, or was it? Where is she flashing um, back to? Maybe it wasn't a flashback. Maybe she's just staring out the window at it. But mm. I, I don't quite understand what they're getting at with her connection to this windmill and the process and what oh. she's experiencing right now. So the the interpretation, like me and Pete and Ron came up with while you were out, was that you know Dot is a delusional person. That you know when you go back into like episode three or four, where she's at the hospital and uh, Indira and Wilt far trying to impress upon her and like no you actually were kidnapped and we have it on i saw you and and uh she's i think i can't remember if she said it or danish grave said it for her that like if all due respect we have our own reality and wilt's like that's not mm-hmm. something that you get to have i think you're supposed to explicitly understand that the deal with her trauma and maybe some abandonment guilt that she had for leaving gator behind 
um, and maybe some possible like that that she knew. I, I think deep down she knew Linda was dead. Maybe she even saw Will or Roy kill her, but she's blocked all that out and re created a new substitute reality where she just got out scot free, didn't commit any crimes, didn't hurt anybody, got a new life, and and she's like. Um, almost pretend like that old life was a dream and then Roy flips it on her where it's like yo no it's the opposite that old other life you had was a dream this is reality but I think this is just her like you know she even tells did you think that she told Gator the truth from her perspective that her mom is still alive and she met her or do you think she was trying to manipulate Gator last episode see that that was very confusing to me too because she knows it was just a vision or she should know that it was just a, a I, dream she had I think that, but that's starting to make a lot more sense. If she's actually delusional, if she especially is when she and... had the huge head trauma with the SUV accident, I mm -hmm. think that like yes, she rem like that really made it hazy too. But they're, that's I, I think they're just Holly's playing with the idea of people living in their delusions and like blocking out things that frighten them or disquiet them, and only just going with the things that you know make them feel comfy. Um, and her, this and is we the been last two episodes explicit. have her been well yeah i know but like because from all. my perspective for the first he's <laughs> not a black and white guy you know well for the first six episodes from my perspective she was lying to people around her and she knew she was lying i, I never once felt like she actually believed the things she was saying she was saying them because she needed to keep from blowing up her new life which she loved yeah, I wish they had made it more I mean, explicit. And and even in the the episode where she has the vision of the doll stuff, I still didn't get the impression that she was delusional or deluding herself or I anything other than pretty pretty neuronormal. But well, I mean, I think the even neurologically nor like, you know, non-neurodivergent people can have like and oh, I, sure, I guess sure. the I question is like could could you have so much trauma that you have a delusion and now you're still neurotypical i, I don't know sure. but i, I it, it, it might be an open question in the first six episodes whether she was like truly delusional or just like trying to keep it together but i think that the car accident she goes through you're supposed to understand that she's a little more loose grasp on what's real what's not real and the last two episodes have her been progressively coming to grips with what actually happened and her place in it so that's that's where that's that's where I interpreted the flashbacks as being kind of like these intrusive thoughts that she's having the the, hmm. the reality crashing into her delusion and this is this dis yeah that it. makes a certain amount of sense um, now nine episodes into the series yeah um, all right but it uh, has been something like I mean he's played it fair it's like he's been something that they've been talking about since episode three people like having their own delusions like mm -hmm. roy is living a delusional life i think lorraine's living a delusional life you know that she is this yeah it's 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 something that i hmm. when when you talk about delusions in that regard i don't think those are actual delusions i think those are people knowingly lying about things like they understand that the world is not like this they understand that these events didn't take place but they are willing to say that they did because it serves their own agenda uh or, or fits into the worldview that they want to have. I, I, th there to me is a distinction there between actual delusion and just lying to yourself. I wonder what a psychologist would say. Yeah. I, like what I'd is like, is, is, is that actually a line or is it a continuum? I mean, oh, obviously sure if is, you're yeah. like, if you're truly delusional, like you're seeing auditory and visual hallucinations, that's a different class than a person who tells themselves something enough that they truly believe it. But right. like, there's a lot of there's a lot of studies to show that like you know uh, just telling the same true story over and over and over again, just the, the, the variations you give it, rewrite your mental circuits and like you it, it'll it's every time you retell sure. it with a slightly different thing and it's not like you're like oh I'm making up a lot I'm embellishing things it's just it just happens mm -hmm. uh, and then it's like you know what is the true memory what what can you extract the core memory from all the times you've retold it all the times you've revisited it. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, and, and maybe that that's another thing that Holly's playing with this season. Uh, what the nature of delusions and how they apply politically? Because yeah, like right now, if you're paying attention to the news, uh, there's a big story which essentially it, it was a crime committed if a person genuinely believed that they were acting to save a stolen election. 
And how can one know the interior thoughts? How can anyone be guilty of a crime if you can't establish their state of mind? Never mind that we do that mm -hmm. in courts of law all the fucking time. But that's 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 the that's one of the issues de jour is was mm -hmm. a crime committed if a person truly believed regardless of how many statements you can produce and how many sworn statements. So it's like, I, it is pretty timely that, you know, what is the line mm -hmm. between people mm -hmm. being delusional, people lying and people self deluding. I, yeah, shit, man, I don't know. Yeah. But, and how how the, do you distinguish from the outside? What the, which, which one of those that person is, right? I feel like that's something that like, uh, communities dis decide, like that's where ultimately, yeah. you know, if enough people be like, nah, you're full of shit, that's what ends up happening. Um, <laughs> but we're just having, uh, <laughs> we're having a speak right now about who, how many people is on either side of the delusion and who gets to have that say. Right. Uh, so Bowman goes out to the shack to kill dot, but the place is seemingly empty. He runs off to tell Roy as Dot undoes her cuffs from below the floor where she was hiding. Um, Finally got that nail she's been working work, work, working on getting. Yeah. Yeah, just took her busting through the floor to do it. Uh, honestly, you could probably drag that uh, that's, uh, box spring out the door. Like, it's not a very secure thing to shackle her to. It's, yeah, it would be like I don't know. I, she could I do would, it. She's a tiger. Come yeah. on. I think she should Tony Stark it and turn it into some kind of spring trap armor suit, you know, with yeah. like sharpened <laughs> scythes and use it to yeah, to bounce her way out of the place. Dot Lions built this from a cot in an outbuilding. <laughs> Sorry, sir. I'm I'm not Dorothy Lion. Yep. Uh, okay, Lorraine can't reach Danish. And Indira says, well, his cell phone was shut off late last night out at the Tillman Ranch. So Lorraine tells her to call the orange idiot. The Lorax? Yeah, I think so. I okay. think so. It's the only person with enough power in the government to do anything. Uh-huh. That's interesting. So two couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, Indira, stunning in her corporate security wear. I like her what better in the up. uniform. I don't know what that yeah. says about me, but sure. Uh, she doesn't Nothing look wrong. bad in this. Nothing wrong with admiring a woman in uniform. Also, not wearing her wedding ring. She is done Good. with that, dude. Thank yeah. God. It's about fucking time, man. I, yeah. The yeah. episode where she catches them together, I'm like, yes, let this be it, please. Yeah. And it is. Yeah, we got some great feedback on that too um we actually got started we've been adding some the, 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 the feedbackers been out doing themselves good for the last couple of weeks uh you said you had a couple things um oh yeah the fact that she looks stunning and she has no wedding ring those are two things oh two things i find okay. them as a couple yep <laughs> uh it, it, uh let me address the orange idiot real quick um oh yeah i think we all know who she's talking about I I was interested in the way she talks about him. I mean, describing him as the orange idiot. Um, he's obviously a very powerful man. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't... I don't know how powerful, because this all takes place in 2019, right? So, like... Yes. This is sort of toward the end of the orange idiot's reign. Uh, at least yeah, official reign. About a, about a year to go. Mm-hmm. Um, she clearly has disdain for him. She thinks, uh -huh. at best, he's a useful tool. Uh, that doesn't she does not respect him in any way. Obviously, is this is this sort of an indication of how Holly thinks that most people who interface with that kind of a person think of them? I think that there's so there's a. Uh, I might step on an emailer's toes a little bit. I think a guy named Paul emailed us and said that he sees this as a divide between like the neoconservatives and the modern MAGA movement that sure. like, you know, Lorraine is uh, like a Bush era neoconservative. Mm -hmm. And I think you're supposed to understand that she's talking to William Barr here that uh, oh, is because okay. uh, she Maybe. calls him Bill later. Gotcha. Uh, the timeline doesn't wa wor work because he is the becomes um, attorney general in February of the next year, I think. Um, but I might maybe I got the timeline on that. 
but he you know he was the attorney general for bush one um so Ooh. like this is her she's 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 calling the orange idiot but she's actually talking if if i'm right she's actually talking to and and i think william barr turned out to be like a a, a neoconservative and 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 uh trump's problems um were you know he he tried to use a lot of traditional republican operatives and operations and those are not <laughs> you know that those are, are not yeah. shot through with mag or at least that they weren't you know eight years ago so I, I think that's like she represents like an old school arch conservative that, yeah, sure, like, you know, she's running a debt company. She's preying on poor people, but she's doing it within the bounds of the law. <laughs> you know, she's not mm -hmm. she's not committing crimes. Maybe she's written some of those laws. Sure. But she's not committed versus, you know, Roy, who's like, fuck there. Uh, he is outside. He is an outlaw, you know, um, the, once you say that the judges are corrupt the deep states running everything. Mm -hmm. Even the politicians on your side are are thwarting the will of the people. There's nothing left but violent revolution, right? Because you sure. think the government's a sham, and that's like you know the 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 quintessential I think problem we got going on here is that like one side just thinks the game's rigged and uh, uh, no no I mean just, there's and there's nothing other than a 1776 style cleaning of the house is going to fix it, um, and then the rest of us are just trying to get free health care uh mm -hmm. so yeah i but I, I i agreed with the emailer that i think that lorraine is that kind of like old school arch republican conservative and she probably loathes Ma the trump and his, the, the maga movement but she's also going to contribute yeah. to it because it's roughly speaking her side sure and it can be a useful tool for her yeah um what you gonna do elect joe biden <laughs> right come on uh he's practically a communist jim well yeah it would have been hillary at that he's point, wanting to right? write off all that student debt hello hello uh -huh. coddle these fucking kids she she hasn't even gotten to the student debt issue yet man <laughs> she like that's that's 2020 stuff that's what we're talking about mm. uh she turns out she's, she's still on her Pizza middle Gate. names her middle name's fanny may uh -huh. Lorraine fanny may lion and she 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 runs that division too Probably. Uh, all right. Indira calls Wit and tells him that the FBI is going to raid the ranch and he's got to go save Dot. So he rolls out. Um, I like how concerned both of these characters are about Dot's safety. Um, Indira, I think, out of some uh, sen sense of like a uh, girl power sort of thing, especially after the whole fiasco with uh, Lars and then Wit because she's saved his life. And like both of these people are just like these are my characters in this show. I I love Indira. I love Wit uh, because of their bravery and their decency and just like everything that so many of these other characters are not. They yeah. embody the positive qualities that you want uh, in a, in a human being, let alone in law enforcement officers. Yeah, actual strength, actual you know dignity, actual bravery. Um, I, I I I can't I couldn't agree more. Uh, and then we go to the exact uh, counterexample here where Roy live streams a call to arms for all patriots to rally up at his ranch. Sends out the code 10, 10 double zero, whatever. Uh, and this is the scene where, you know, immediately after he sends out that call, we get the YMCA needle drop and Odin's crew shows up at the ranch and starts prepping for a battle. I think Roy's like, uh, don't forget to use promo code Masada when you're ordering your <laughs> your end your your bug out buckets. Each bug out bucket can feed a family of five for five days. Don't forget to use code Masada when you order those bug mm -hmm. out buckets. Yeah, it's like it's, it's it's all it's all the grift, man. Yeah, I saw this on the Righteous Gemstones last season. Don't order uh -huh. those buckets. It goes badly. <laughs> yeah. And then um, he references Ammon Lavoy. Did you, did you did you clock those names? So those are the no. guys, the the Am, the Bundy family that was beefing with the Bureau of Land Management and the Forestry sure. Service about public water and land use rights. Uh, these these uh, his sons and this Lavoy character uh, took over a wildlife refuge in Oregon for like a month back in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, Lavoy ends up uh, dying, um, being taken into custody. The others not, but he's, he's essentially saying 
it's just a ridiculous thing, you know, when I go, like, compared, like, again, I go, go back to Waco and Ruby Ridge, which are back, you know, when I was uh, a conservative to touch points, and I'm like, it's far cry having a, 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 a compound of fanatic the, the, the uh, followers and then taking over what's essentially a visitor center, you know, <laughs> the place where you get the brochures for your trail maps and take a shit before you hit the trailhead, you know, that's what, that's what they're occupying. Yeah. I mean, you got to get your beachhead somewhere, right? If you're gonna take the country, true. Yeah, I mean, might true. as well start at the visitor center. Might as well start in the middle of dumb fuck nowhere, but fuck nowhere, Oregon, and fight your way out of there. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But the whole grab your beans, your bullets, and your big fucking hammer, <laughs> big and cut the YM YMCA Young Men's Christian Association, which is a fair thing to call what Roy's doing out here with his his buddy Odin. Sure, you know? Young Men's Christian. Association. A lot of ways to have a good time. A lot of oh, ways so to have many, a good time. so many. For a young yeah. man. It's all when you're with your brothers in Christ, mm -hmm. trying to stay warm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Dot sneaks into Roy's house. She finds a phone in his bedroom, which she uses to call Wayne. Uh, while she's distracted, Roy's new wife finds her, and Dot tries to convince her to join forces to take Roy down. It doesn't work, but it does get her close enough to grab the gun and knock her out. So uh, then she sneaks downstairs into the kitchen, turns on the gas stove, and walks out the door. Yeah, we find out that Karen, poor Karen got beat after Dot got her beating uh, last episode, and uh, is un and and uh, it's it's always fascinating to see her process the truth of Dot's words. Like you know, we could mm -hmm. take him down, you'll never get beat again again, and and uh, and neither will your daughters because I. I I don't know if Karen's ever put that together that like as soon as his daughters get old enough to talk back and you know get go from spankings to beatings uh mm -hmm. and that's that's if Roy doesn't decide he wants to start molesting them uh like you can see that click and it's what kind of enrages her like the the truth being thrown into her own face and it, it lets her step into to, to, to range of the lion's claws and she gets uh, or the tiger's claws she gets taken down but uh it's just a sad scene you know this is uh roy has so thoroughly broken this woman that she is essentially acting as like a fugitive slave patrol well she's created know? an alternate reality where roy is not a bad man right i yeah, I look at that and and I say, yeah, she believes somehow that Roy is is worthy of any love um, or affection and like plays oh, that part out. Him, but I don't think she feels it. I don't, she I don't calls think she him feels weak. That love. That's another mm -hmm. thing that really hits home because yeah, he is. You know. Yeah, I mean, comparatively, he's, certainly, he's a weak person's idea of a strong man. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I think it's really interesting. Well, I'll wait till I get to that point in the episode. But yeah, that's that's kind of the distinction I draw between someone like him versus someone like Wit, who displays at every turn in a non showy way. Right? He's not <laughs> he's not getting out there and live streaming how tough he is. He's not yeah you know playing it for an audience. He's just doing the brave thing that you need to do in given yeah. the circumstances. And that to me is the the truly strong person. Yeah. Uh, so Roy walks into his house and instantly smells the gas and he turns it all off. Um, he begins searching the house for Dot. He finds a shitload of money in a bag in Gator's closet. Is this... I know I shouldn't bring it up, but is this the bag? Are you talking about the Fargo bag? Mm-hmm. No, I don't think no. so. Because that was a briefcase. By the, that was also a briefcase. Yeah, we, you're right. Me, me and... Uh, uh pete went went around about that it turns out we were both right that uh did you recall that um oh i can't remember this guy's name but he plays the grocery king oh in yeah, yeah season mm -hmm. one that he claimed that he'd found that million dollars that's how he started his uh -huh. so we have dealt the fargo money but then Lorne Mal Malvo put the literal fear of God into him. He thought that the money was cursed, so he took the briefcase, stuffed it full of a million dollars, and buried mm -hmm. it back where he found it. So, like, the Fargo money has both been found and lost again, so it's still out there. No, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think this has anything to do with that. Okay. What but is blood from money? Then? It's, oh, this is from, uh, so this I... is the money, this is the money that Roy kicked the munch to make them square, that munch Gator left in never his back. never gave it to him? 
No, oh, he, oh, he did. pulled it out of the back seat. Yes, right that's what he, he got out of the back seat. Which was yeah, and then apparently he took it back, didn't give it to his dad. He was keeping it for himself for his own purposes. I had no so. idea that that was the money. I thought that was some piece of evidence that linked him somehow to Munch. And I yeah, I I wow. didn't when, the, when I first right. watched it, I didn't know what it was either. I had to watch it again and like, what is this? Oh, that's the yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't watch that one again because I didn't have the podcast Obviously, on yeah. it. So you're, like, uh, huh, okay, that makes way more sense. Um. So he kept the curse alive, essentially. You know, even if he hadn't killed the old woman, I feel yeah. like this would be a thing for Munch to come after him. You know, the the oh yeah 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 scales are still it's, off, right? It's double 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 debt. Yep. Daily double debt for for Gator. Um. All right, let's uh, go over to Gator. Then the eyeless Gator is kind of led through the wilderness by Munch. We're gonna find out that he's taken him to the ranch. Uh, but we don't really know that yet. Mm-hmm. It's kind of curious how this was all going to tie back in while I was watching it. Uh, and then the FBI continues their approach to Roy's ranch, as Dot finds a safe place and then calls Lorraine. Uh, she tells her the Danish is dead, and Lorraine says, there's an army coming to save you, and Indira tells her to hide somewhere they won't look for her. This is, this is the point at which Lorraine calls her refers to her as her daughter and this is apparently deeply affecting to dot and i was surprised by that because up until now i had never felt like dot was seeking any kind of approval from lorraine whatsoever i do it's kind of like it's funny this is the go-to i'm going to go to but it is what it is you know like in anchorman when ron burgundy and uh uh what's his face the the other the newscaster from the other newsroom they've been beefing they've been fighting and then at the end uh you know he's pulling ron out of the bear pit and he's like ron burgundy i hate you with every fiber of my being but god damn it i respect you and they like hug each other they bro hug i think it turns out that they're actually brothers too <laughs> it's one of the one of those things where it's like yeah i don't think dot was ever seeking lorraine's approval but having it handed to you on a silver platter, like this deep respect and affection from this fierce woman, probably still like this tiger to tiger, like this lion to tiger, not of respect, still probably meant a lot, you know? Yeah, to me, it came across as like she's overwhelmed with emotions here because of her circumstances. Um, less so than I value any kind of respect I might get from this woman. Huh. Um, no, I disagree. I think it meant a lot to her. It's just not something she was looking for. I feel like Mar- you know, I'm not she looking for Mar- this hey, woman. I'm not looking for Martin Scorsese's approval, right? But if he called me up to me yesterday and said, "You know, I was, I know, Aaron, I was listening to your flowers of killer. I'm, you're a hell of a you, you got some great points. I'd really like to. I would be fucked. I'd probably yeah. Have but tears do you in respect eyes, right? Martin Scorsese? Okay, you're right. I do respect him. I don't think Dot you don't respects. Think, Lorraine. Wait, you don't think Dot respects Lorraine? Really? No, I think she views her as a kind of vile person. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, that's the impression I took away, but maybe that's just my own feelings on the matter. <laughs> maybe I'm transferring those to this character. I've been trying to recalibrate because, like, man, a lot of people are not down with Lorraine being evil. I was kind of surprised to take that, like, it seems really? I don't know how prominent Jeez. it is in our audience, like, percentage-wise, but, like, I've gotten a lot of pushback. I held Ron pushback on it, like, saying I don't think she's, like, um, you know, she's like doing bad things or things that maybe we don't approve of or wish she could do better in society, but she's not evil. And where I'm like comfortable with, like, she has a disdain. Evil. She for... she's like Corella Deville type of evil. Like she's not, yeah, she's not murdering people. Maybe her evilness like uh, is is making coats out of puppies, but still, <laughs> maybe it's lowercase e evil. It's not Pol Pot or Hitler evil, but right, right. She wouldn't fit yeah. into Mister Rogers' yeah. neighborhood. Is what I'm saying. No, they've already got a tiger anyway. They don't need her. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, clearly, this does affect Dot. It's not. It's not debatable. Um, unless you have your own version of reality here. But something uh, that yeah. we have been debating in the weeks that you've been gone is like the subtle hints that maybe there was something going on between Danish and Lorraine. 
Did you see any? I mean, I don't. Uh, I, I literally don't think it matters because grain uh, da- <laughs> Danish is moldering in the grave. But yeah, it does not matter at this point. But I, I mean, I could there. maybe see it. I here. Here's the thing. Out of everyone in this show, he's the one person that she has respected consistently. Um, he's her go-to whenever she has a problem that needs to be solved. She believes yeah. that he can get the job done no matter the circumstances. Um, so, so if it's not like a physical romantic thing, then it's certainly like a spiritual thing. She, mm. she respects the man. Yeah. At the very least. Um, so the FBI arrives and so does wit. And there's a standoff while the FBI decides how to approach the situation. Wit asks that he be allowed to lead a team to save Dot, and they agree since she's an asset in the prosecution of Roy. She is the top of the list. I really love this scene, the banter between the, what is it, the FBI guy and the two agents. No, there, there are two. It's SWAT. One is SWAT, one is FBI. Oh, yeah. One is the local, is the state uh-huh. like police, and the other is the FBI. So you got yeah. the state, federal. Yeah. And their their banter back and forth is so good. <laughs> also, I like that too. Don't you know better than to interrupt a superior officer when they're bantering? <laughs> Did they teach you that at Quantico? Uh huh. And uh, I I enjoyed that too. And um, I thought that uh, I enjoyed the no also... nonsense and competency of these characters. The, 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 I, and I think the just ahead, ruthless efficiency of them. You know, they're here to do a job, and they're very serious men. And they seem almost a counterpoint to Roy, who is trying to be what they actually are. Thank you. And I'm like, and I think there's levels to it because that's exactly the point I wanted to make that these are, you know, they're coming up. Oh, we got 40 weekend warriors spread out here, there and other. And they think they're being clever and they're hiding, but we actually have a drone in the sky. We can see all this and like the, the true professionals. And it's not, because like the thing Roy makes a point, it's like, oh, you were in a firefight. We're in a fire hi- fight against the, uh, you know, uh, oh, American sh- no, no. cop and 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 uh, forty guys who were just shooting with Iraqi. I don't know. He's, he's, he's a in, piglet like, 40. And something. Yeah, I think he's referring to himself, like, right? And then forty guys who were like just over in Iraq shooting insurgents. So he's essentially saying all of his guys are battle hardened soldiers, which is probably sure. true. But the thing is, like, I think these types that, the, like, you know, the, I've, I've seen a lot of these kind of militia guys or ex-military and, like, you know, it's like, oh, we're, we're, we can square up against the United States. The United States military does not kick so much ass around the globe because the individual valor and might of our fighting men and women, although that's considerable. Like, mm-hmm. like don't get me wrong, not killing, coming after Delta Force or Marine <laughs> Force no. Recon. Those guys Obviously are badass. impressive people. Yeah. Very impressive people. The United States kicks ass globally because of our logistics and because of our technology and because mm-hmm. of the way all those things work together. Yeah. And an individual person with a gun, 40 people with a gun, are going to be ran through by any force that's got like the kind of intelligence, the kind of data gathering capabilities, and the logistics that the United States has. Um, and that's what – the, 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 yeah, like it is – I mean, you could you could probably do, uh, you know, like I, I think, I don't know, like I, like like a rebellion against the United States. I don't think it would look like another civil war. I think it would look like, like the troubles in Ireland, or <laughs> yeah. you know, like like what's going on in, in Palestine right now, where you know you got more guerrilla people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, terror tactics and things yep. like that, like low scale conflict um, for years and years at a time. It sounds like it's it's super unpleasant. I don't want to be going through the mall and get shot up when I'm trying to get a pair of pants. You know, that's not the kind of country I want to live in, but it's not they, they, they're the, the, the idea that they can win mm-hmm. is just, it's just not going to happen. And, and yeah, when this FBI guy comes up and like has the, even though Roy's on his horse and he's got his gun and all his men, like it's clear who is the person who is the one that's in charge and who's going to probably get their way. Yeah. And I, I think the Holly is deliberately saying this is the real McCoy and this is the counterfeit. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I I don't know why I was getting, well, I do know why I was getting emotional over this, like wit coming in and saying, we need to put dot on this priority list because she's a priority 
And, you know, he's he's defending that. And the FBI agents are defending that, saying, yeah, when we go to prosecute this guy, we're going to need her testimony. Uh, but Witt's not doing it for that reason. Witt's doing that because she saved his life um, yeah. because he doesn't want her to die. And I'm just, I'm, I feel like I'm getting emotional watching this scene because of the bravery that Witt is displaying. He's not... He's not saying, hey, you guys, when you go in, could you maybe, you know, grab Dot? He's saying, I want to lead a team in to go get her. And there's a man who can barely walk at this point. You you see him, yeah, he's not on a crutch anymore, but he's limping throughout this entire episode. He's still feeling yeah. the effects of the gunshot that almost took his life and Dot saved him from. So, like, yeah. It's, and when he lines, that's lines up with this hostage rescue team, like they've all got like level three vests with steel plates and yeah. Kevlar helmets. And he's showing up in his like, yeah, I'm sure he's got a vest on, but he's got his side and they got rifles mm -hmm. and night vision shit. He's got his like little Fargo, you know, fur hat and his sidearm. Yeah. But he's going in with all these other guys, the warriors, because, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. he, he's. That's that's his calling. That's his duty. Yeah. Uh, I really can't say enough good about this guy. Uh, Odin asks <laughs> Roy if this is the last stand or the start of something in pretty hilarious terms. Uh, Roy doesn't answer. He just tells him nobody shoots until I say go. Uh, I mean, this is, yeah, this is lays it out. It's like, you know, are you Hitler in the Reichstag or Hitler in the bunker? Is this your first or last days? Because all I see yeah. is a hobo digging a ditch for a piece of ass you couldn't control when he had the chance. Like, the, the tide has turned. It's not because, like, the moon changes orbit. It's because you're a dumbass, Roy, is mm -hmm. what Odin's saying here. Um, yeah. To an extent, you almost wonder why Odin's backing him. Because it seems like everyone else was running for the hills. The governor not returning his phone calls. Mm-hmm. Like, why did Odin, you know, back his boy here? Why doesn't he just be like... Yeah, Is it because his daughter's road. mixed up in it? Yeah, that's the easy answer right there. It's, it's the only blood, thing. Blood means that. a lot to these fuckers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Blood and soil. The blood and the land. Yeah, it's like... And, and rightfully so. Like. I don't want to say, like, family shouldn't mean anything. It's, yeah, right. no, no. Yeah, I, it should, yeah. but, like... Yeah. That's got to be his reasoning. Well, she's stuck yeah. with this dumb fuck. Who I thought, yeah, because yeah, because the way he phrases that, you know, he says something about like I thought that Roy was like this tough guy who was gonna. Yeah. I, I let my daughter marry you because I thought you were a conqueror, and now you're just a conqueror, hobo digging yeah. a ditch. Right. So now he's stuck in this with him. Uh, so Roy rides out to talk to the FBI, and they tell him that they have a warrant and they're coming in, and he tells them to leave before they all end up dead. And everyone is just recalcitrant in this scene; they're not giving an inch. Which makes a lot like, of sense. Uh, I like it. The scene in the extended edition of uh, the Return of the King, where uh, the mouth of Sauron rides out of the gates and and treats with Aragorn and and Gandalf. Because um, hmm. yeah, it's like I, as this this person that's trying to appear that they're in control and they're powerful, and the guys are coming to bring him out of that hole, willingly or not. Uh, like, nah, you're not. Mm, it's not happening. Uh, there's nothing he can do to intimidate these these FBI guys. No, but it always takes people by surprise. I think Roy's attitudes yeah. always always put people off on 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 like a weird footing, right? Because he's yeah. so abrasive. He's so like everything he's saying is so self assured. It's it's so in your face. He he clearly does not give a shit what you think about him in his words. I, I, I don't know what it is about the way he's speaking here, but everything, every time he meets somebody new, they're always shocked at his demeanor. Because I think it's like the way he's saying all the things like a, a great man would say, like, I am here. I'm called by God. I was, I was, my, my name was carved in my bones and it's the only thing I can do. And you are, you, you know, uh, uh, he the god blows the horn and makes the walls fall you came for lots why but she's already pillar. he's just like doing this weird verbal diarrhea this word salad of scriptural mm -hmm. mishmash and it's all like but like we also know that he's planning if the things go bad that he's gonna bug out get the fuck out of here he's gonna try to live right. and fight another day so it's like he's saying all these great inspirational things but he's an empty suit and there's something 
I, I think you can kind of tell the difference. And like like what like when Wilt was dealing with them last episode, it's like there's this kind of like odd disconnect between this guy who's talking all this tough talk, but you know, like deep down, he's kind of a dandy. He's not gonna do any of this shit. I mean, I I don't know if I'd go that far. Like, th- there's something about him. I mean, he okay. He the way they risk... portrayed him, he's he's willing to murder people in cold blood. He's willing to get on the opposite side of the law, knowingly. Like, he's he's not not a dangerous and impressive man in some ways. But but there is that element of like artificiality to it all as well. Because he's because here's the thing he's willing to do la violence to others who have no ability to respond but he's unwilling to receive violence himself. Okay. And I think a real a real patriot that. has no problems and, and and is always living with the the awareness that that violence might come back to him and they're fine with that. That's the cost. Yeah, the wits of, of the world, right? That's the cost of my beliefs. Like, if I have to die mm-hmm. to protect something I believe in, die to protect an innocent person, that's I'm in the profession of arms, baby. That's the deal. I get to carry this gun. I get to wear this badge. I get to boss people around because at the end of the day, I'm going to fight for the things, not even that I believe in, but what the community. The, I'm fighting for the rules that the community have said that are important. Yeah, and yeah. Roy doesn't. Like, Roy is going to cut mm-hmm. and run the first time it's him against the line, uh, uh, against the wall. Yeah, and he explicitly doesn't value the opinions of the community or the the people around him at all. I mean, no. he doesn't even va- he doesn't even value God's word. He doesn't it doesn't yeah. bother to, to quote it correctly. Like he that's just a justification for him to do the things he wants to do. Mm-hmm. It's it's like, you know, Lorraine said, he's a he's a he's a baby. He wants to do the things he wants to do when he wants to do it. Doesn't want anyone to tell him what to do, but he doesn't want any responsibility either. So Roy thinks Dot's still on the property somewhere, and he says, I'll go check the dugout, and he sends Bowman to check the grave, which I assumed when he said that he meant the, you know this windmill hole uh, where they dump the bodies. Um, and that's true. So Dot runs to the windmill, and she gets inside the grave, and Bowman arrives with some goons and heads out there. And we're going to kind of cut back and forth here. Um, there, little, there's little, this shot. Yeah, I was gonna say a little sloppy job for the tiger to lead the rifle up, up, up uh, top. Pr- pretty sloppy. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I don't know. Look, there's a lot going on. She's that's true. Running for her life. It's a high stress. She kind of hears someone coming, and she's like, her first priority is to get down and undercover. Then yeah, uh, yeah. I, I agree. I think it's a little silly that she leaves the rifle up there and it doesn't meaningfully change anything. She's not going to shoot her way out of this hole, but yeah, I, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, they, they do a a little insert shot here of her looking over and seeing something hanging from the wall of this hole. And I could not for the life of me tell what it was. I thought it was like, is this some necklace from Linda? Because Roy had mentioned how, Yeah, how how he had actually killed Linda and uh-huh. all that, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, it's necklace necklace from Linda. It's proof. Turns out it's just Danish's eye patch, which I don't is that understand. Necessary? He's I in don't the understand. fucking I... hole. We see, you can his see body. him laying down. Yeah, yeah, you can see him with his white hair and his 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 tan coat, and I don't understand why they showed that to. There's some kind. I've I've saw some theories that there's some kind of Oedipal Oedipus Oedip- Oedipal um reference with a gator and uh maybe being in love with his stepmother and maybe and then you know getting blinded and there's this fixation with uh um hmm. graves danish being half blind because he's there's because he's kind of infatuated with Lorraine. i but i don't i don't know i don't i, I don't know why they show that um interesting yeah I don't know if, if you know just be quirky Fargo if, stuff. If but. you if if you listener know Fargo at baldmove.com because like just like last week's episode title blanket I have no <laughs> fucking clue what blanket or eye patch means. All right, so Roy is out searching the dugout and he finds nothing but the remnants of Munch's uh, satanic ritual. I not satanic, but you know, it has a look of a satanic ritual. Uh once is he emerges this a new- 
is this new though? Like, I did he I do so. another ritual before? So like, Roy's just never uh, checked his dugout. Like he he Barely. got a goat killed. That is that Roy's goat? Got to be right. I mean, Munch doesn't have a supply of goats anywhere. Yeah, I guess maybe you don't check the dugout in the winter, uh, even though you had a half naked man covered in shit and blood <laughs> going into your daughter's room and put satanic <laughs> stuff on the walls. So you wouldn't check off. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I thought maybe the uh, the implication was that uh, uh, um, that Munch spun all this up again for this latest incursion. I don't think so. He doesn't look very blood covered in his it's scenes. True. So it's true. Uh, anyway, yeah. Once he emerges from the dugout, he finds Munch waiting with Gator on a leash, and he says he's returning his useless hand as payment for the double cross, and then he disappears. Yeah, this um, is the first scene where I felt sorry for Gator when he's crying for Daddy, yeah. and Roy's telling him to shut up, and if there is ever a point to you, it's gone now. He, I the think you're supposed to understand he leaves him to die out there. Yeah, he's useless. Um, How the hell is it? It's snowing. It's cold. Gator doesn't have proper gear. How the hell is he going to get back blind? It'd be one thing if he's blind for years, and but like, yeah, he's got no experience of this. He feels helpless. He's afraid. Um, I felt for him. Yeah, this is some cold-blooded shit that Roy does uh, to his own son. It's doesn't feel like Gator's going to get any kind of redemption. It feels like he's just getting like Old Testament biblical punishment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the hmm. Does he get any? <laughs> does he get any? Uh, resolution here I mean because the thing that he learns in this scene is that his father literally does not care about him in any way which is something that Dot told him last episode but he was too angry to hear things that right. Dot's just a liar but it did stick I mean you can see that punch kind of landed he gets pissed off in his car and you know you're acting like this away, is a but... consolation prize this is like you know uh, getting the wheel of fortune board game if you if you crap out but like uh -huh. I don't know knowing that your father hates you and doesn't respect you even a little bit at least he uh, can start his life I mean he's been living no, this yeah, life in his life he's gonna freeze to death out here blind hurting well, he and afraid to death, yeah <laughs> If, this sure. is on if a he survives beach, this, sure, he has yeah. a new lease on life, right? I mean, yeah, he doesn't have his eyes, but look, I don't know his eyes were doing him any favors anyway. Uh, Munch already he, gave him a new leash on life. He led him, <laughs> led him to the ran ranch. By lease, it. lease. He's done. He's done. He's at the end of this leash. His new leash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, it, look, he he lost his eyes so that he could see, right? He now sees his father for the person he is. And, mm. and look, I don't even know if Gator, being as immature and ridiculous as he is, is even capable of registering all these ideas. But if he makes it through this, he at least is not under the spell of this horrible man anymore. And he has, if he has a decent heart, which I think Dot might think he does, if he has that decent heart, at his core, he could start to actually be a human being worth living alive, as opposed to this nothing that he's been. It's interesting you mention about the, the eye patch here, because this, you know, I'm, I'm putting my uh, metaphor analysis hat on, and you know, the Greek or the Greek god, the the Norse god Odin, sacrificed one of his eyes for wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be because, like, I think Danish Graves saw the world in kind of a false light. You know, he 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 learned the difference between you know soft power and actual power last episode. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know he's blind in one eye, so he's already a wise person. Is this implying a Gator has got like a double dose of that same truth? I mean, yeah, it could be. Just, man, I look at Gator, I don't know that he's equipped. It might take him some time to really, yeah. like I said, register all this. If he gets it. If he gets it. If he doesn't die and if he gets it. I was going to say, do you think he plays a, like, do you, do you think he plays a part or do we, do we cut to him sometime next episode and he's, like, looking like Jack Torrance at the end of The Shining? Yeah. You know? Could be. Could be, because... 
I mean, what's he going to do? Just listen for gunfire and walk that direction? <laughs> he could. I mean, and then just be a lot of shot. that. That's, yeah, he could walk into the middle of a 40v40 gunfight. <laughs> it could be funny. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, he's not dead yet, as they say. Uh, but this is another great scene, you know, with um, Munch here. And he's talking about the, the metaphor of this debt that has to be paid. Um, and, you you know, when someone double crosses you, you cleave their hand from them and return it to them. Still a hand, but useless. Do you I, I wasn't sure what he's talking about. Uh, it's interesting to see how a person describes a double cross. And he says, like, to steal is a man's lineage. It's what he is. Is he? He's he's not talking about a man, men in general. He's talking about this person that mm -hmm. he like the the gate. But like, how did Gator describe the double cross? I guess I, I didn't. That that's the thing that I didn't quite understand what Munch was trying to say. I think he's trying to say well, that your about lineage is defined Roy. by youth taking things from people and not giving things back and not keeping your word. But well, I think it's about Roy, right? Like the useless hand is Roy's hand, which is Gator. Uh -huh. um, so he's yeah. describing Roy as the thief and the person uh -huh. who takes and doesn't give back. So it's kind of of a piece with, um, do you, uh, do you think that, uh, that Munch thinks that this is Roy's plan because Gator did it all on his own. That's maybe a piece of information he doesn't know. Well, I mean, the the initial double cross, I don't know, because Munch has a weird way of looking at the world too, right? Like he views them not telling this them that this one was a tiger as a sort of double cross. And I feel like right. that's the genesis of this whole thing. Um, it was, they're cheating him. They they try to, you know, they, they knew yeah. the real value of this target and they try to make it seem like it's just a housewife. Well, it's kind of of a piece with, with what Roy is saying about the person, you know, their name being etched on bone when they're born, right? And and what he's, what you could imply from this is that Roy has always been this cheater and this thief mm. and this that kind of person and that it's just manifesting in the way he treated Munch. True. And so now this is the, this is the payback for that. I don't know. That's how I choose to look at it. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, Wit tracks down Dot via her cell phone, and his team moves in to rescue her. Bowman's guys find Dot in the hole, but before he can kill her, Munch finds him and kills them. And he uh, takes Dot out of the hole and sets her free. Gives her the gun back. There's a really great Reddit post last week where someone d took um, all the visual um, similarities between Munch and Dot, like the fur lin uh, line kind of tartan pattern overcoat. Uh, Dot has an almost exact same one that she wears mm -hmm. when she's going out to Halloween shop with Wayne. Um, uh, the the kind of tan coat she's wearing now is very similar to the one that Munch wore at the beginning of the season. Uh, sure. even down to the fishing shack that he was torturing Gator in is very, looks identical to the red shack, uh, that Dorothy is being held in. They're mm. definitely drawing comparisons between these two. And I keep going back. I keep going back to dot covering an eight hour drive on foot in the middle of the night. <laughs> I do mm -hmm. wonder if they are literally drawing a parallel and they are hinting that dot has got something supernatural about her, that there is some kind of sin eating capability that she's got. I don't know why they would do that and, and how it would shake out in the last episode, but mm -hmm. it's the probably the biggest question in my mind right now is like, what, what the hell was that all about? Why all these similarities? Why all these parallels between munch and, and dot? Yeah. I don't know. Don't have answers for you. I do know that next week is probably going to be pretty exciting. What do you think of Will trying to warn the FBI hostage rescue team about not killing the hostage? Like, I thought, what 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 do you think the, of the I FBI agent's response? I, like, I couldn't tell if he was like patronizing, like, "Oh, don't shoot the hostage." Thanks, buddy. I felt like he is because this is literally. But he says like, it think... very matter of factly. Like, yeah. like he, he doesn't say it with the animosity that you would think he would say it with if he were insulted by it. 
I think it's because he they do respect this guy. Like the thing, like I think this is preposterous, but the idea that they recognized him as the lone survivor of the shootout and yeah. like he's got like I think there is this kind of a, a spree de, uh, decor that these guys like I you know like yeah you don't belong here, but you kind of by merit and by blood have you're, earned you're your right to be one here. Of us, yeah. Yeah, so they're like anyone else ran up here and told him that they'd probably be like, "Shut the fuck up! We're right. this, we're we are the professionals. We're the professionals. They call them the, the the we're the professionals. The professionals call when they can't get something done." But I don't I don't understand the the point of the scene. Is it just supposed to illustrate how much care that Wilt's got about this, or is it supposed yeah, to set up he cares. the FBI? caring more about the overall mission of bringing the sheriff to justice than they do about, but I, that doesn't strike. Cause like the FBI guy, the special agent in charge was the one that concerned with women and children. And I felt like the state guy was kind of dismissive about it. Yeah. Or that was just them busting their balls too. So like maybe, cause that was, it was, banter. yeah, yeah. I'm not totally certain. I, 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 I want to give them credit and say that like, this is, a guy who's used to dealing with a little less professionalism, a little less care, I guess, because he's just part of the state police or, or whatnot. Whereas these guys are, when they say something is at the top of their list, it's at the top of their list. You don't have to remind them. They've, uh -huh. they, they literally have a list in their head of their objectives and they're prioritizing them second by second. Um, Whereas Wit is used to a little bit more of a, a fudging it kind of thing because yeah. he's working just with, you know, the state patrol or whatever. But I I don't know if that's exactly what they're getting at. But, but in my feeling is when he says this, he's trying to impress upon him that, yes, I have already internalized this idea. The hostage was just brought up a moment ago. I didn't know to know about it at all until two seconds ago when you mentioned it. But I have fully internalized it, and it is our number one top priority right now. And so he doesn't say it as if he's insulted. He's just trying to impress upon this man who's not familiar with their mode of operation. This is now a thing you don't have to worry about. We've got it. One other follow-up. Should I be concerned because the last time we saw Agent Joaquim and his partner talk to their boss, their special agent in charge, about the Roy situation... He said they treated felt, as a hobby. Well, they, they, they also, they, I, I kind of came with those FBI thinking that their boss was kind of on Roy's side or sympathetic to him. Now, I remember you and I kind of like, I'm not, that might have just been yeah. leaping to conclusions and whatnot, but am I supposed to be worried that this is all a bit of an inside job, that there is going to be, that they are going to Well, this was called in by Lorraine at Roy. this point, right? So, to Trump's administration, who we know who is friend, you know, was playing footsie with these types. Like he was, like sure, sure. You know, this is a Joe Arapio, I think is how you pronounce that guy's name. The the sheriff in Phoenix that yeah. ran the mig, you know, that the, did the concentration camps with the the illegal Prisoners, immigrants yeah. and and uh, was do a lot of extra constitutional stuff. And he was at Trump rallies. There's and there's another. I I, I remember being a bunch of ridiculous sheriffs that kind of like would, would show up to his rallies and whatnot. So it's like, in the back of my mind, the two FBI agents and investigator Roy, in their mind, they're the upper echelons the FBI might be corrupt, <laughs> the quote unquote deep state state. And then maybe this guy is. And, and the fact that, that they're belaboring these points is like reminding us as an audience that maybe there is a reason to be concerned with this. But I hope not, because like I really want to like this FBI, this Cal guy, Cal Calhoun or whatever his name is. He like I, I want him to be the anti Roy, the true blue lawman that's going to come out here with the righteous use of state violence. But I don't know. Yeah, and every impression I've gotten of Roy is that he's not a man who builds bridges at all. Um, he doesn't give a shit about making friends, about mm -hmm. having connections. He'd rather silo up with his <laughs> by marriage dudes um, mm -hmm. th than he would go shake hands with a senator or a governor or whatever. Whereas mm -hmm. Lorraine is the one doing that. So I... I, it doesn't feel to me like there's going to be some blowback from a relationship or even ideological perspective in this because Roy is just such a silo, you know? It's just a weird, it's a, there's a lot of weird interactions that I, 
that that's that I've observed this season that I wonder mm-hmm. if will there's going to be some kind of unifying theory of because I think in real life, you know, the 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 real life kind of like 2019, 2020, 2021, and I guess ongoing is the resiliency of institutions against these kind of like cults of personality. The fact that like you sure. know when it comes down to it, the Justice Department, the, the military is just like, no, we're not going to do throw out the Constitution out and just you know because we're even if we are on the same side as you politically, just because that's just not what's done. I don't know another 5, 10, 20 years mm-hmm. uh, if that will, those institutions will still, but like they were strong as of three years ago. So I would hate for yeah. Holly to be kind of like, what if actually they are corrupt and hollow and can't protect us? Because I don't think that's the truth, but. Yeah, it's tough it. sometimes to know with Fargo what they're getting at. What What is a very, very dry joke and what yeah. is meant to be taken seriously? And and, and where he's when the guy dis- says the thing about the hostage, I literally can't tell if he's yeah. joking or if he's being a serious person who's trying to convey how serious he is. Which I'm like, you know, more like, well, maybe it's just a just a you know just a random scene to to fill out the episode. But then, you know, that's not what Holly does. And then there's also yeah. part of the Trump era is the whole like, well, you can't listen to what he says. You got to kind of read the tea leaves of what he's actually meaning. So it's like there's a little bit of. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, and it's also hard to tell when Holly's being descriptive, which he's just describing the way he thinks the world is versus prescriptive, where he's like, what the world ought or should or might be. Sure. Um, it's always when you're doing that satire, it's, it's you can get lost in the weeds there. Yep. But that's it for the episode. It is indeed. We have some feedback. I've been teasing it all episode. I think we got some good feedback this uh, this week. Fargo at baldmove.com is how you send that feedback. Fargo at baldmove.com. Before we get the feedback real quick, uh, if you want to know what we're doing, we're getting to the end of Fargo here, but we got lots more prestige ahead, including True Detective this weekend. Oh, boy. The uh, reviews of season four are just stellar. Uh, it comes out this Saturday, Sunday. We'll be doing an instant take. We'll be doing full coverage the following week. If you're looking for another crime show, uh, highly recommend that one on HBO Max. Uh, but if you want to know what we're doing throughout the year, uh, don't lose track of us. Uh, follow us. Pick, pick a social media, your favorite social media. We're at Bald Move wherever you are, except for TikTok. We're at Bald Move there. And then finally, if you've enjoyed our coverage of Fargo and you'd like to help keep us doing what we're doing, you like access to other bonus content like our instant talk and take podcast after True Detective, and you want ad-free feeds, we'd appreciate your support at support.baldmove.com. Fargo at baldmove.com is our email address. Jim, do you want to take the first one? Sure. Haley writes in and says, I feel so defeated after this episode. I think maybe the in-your-face attitude of this particular episode got to me more than it normally would for a specific reason. I'm a social worker who works with families who have had their children removed from their care. And not two nights ago, I sat with a woman who was terrified of her boyfriend but can't figure out how to leave. I sat with her and her boyfriend and tried to act as professional as I could not put her in harm's way after I left while trying to communicate with her through eye contact that I am here for her and want to help. I cannot remember when anything I've watched has made me so angry and so uncomfortable. The hospital scene where deputy wit tries to step in had me so scared for both him and dot. They did such a good job making me feel uh, with making me feel dots desperation. It feels like literally everyone that is trying to help her, the lady at the hospital, wit, the lawyer, all get crushed by Roy and his stupid power moves. There was a line that Roy said that really has me wondering about how this is all going to play out. He said something about how she has always been there and the rest of it was a dream. We have the Wizard of Oz theme playing so heavily in this season. Is our Dorothy dreaming all of this? It does not seem plausible to me at all, and I really hope not, but that line is sticking with me and has me wondering how this will end. The name Dorothy seems so strong and to be pointing us to her being like that character it got me wondering about the name nadine and what significance it might hold i couldn't think of any characters named nadine so i googled it to find out what it means it means hope well that's a hopeful way to end the email message um i i don't think there's ever going to be it's all a dream like they've already even especially now they pulled it once this season (laughs) i was gonna say didn't they yeah yeah I do. I, I kind of like the metaphor that I think we've explored in previous episodes. I'm not sure if you were here for it, that, that this is an anti-Wizard of Oz, where it's like, you know, Dorothy's 
home in Wizard of Oz was this dull gray place that she wanted to escape to this colorful, exciting life outside of her home that then she, uh, retrospect, had a pining for and went back. Whereas Dot, her home is the vibrant, beautiful, safe ex- place that she wants to just sit and curl up on the couch with Wayne and watch Desperate Housewives and cook bis- you know, cook pancakes for Scotty. And she's being taken to the, the land of Oz against her will, and it's violent and scary and garish and dark. And she wants to get back. So it's like, I, I think the metaphor is there. It's like a reverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oz, Kansas situation, but that's yeah. I, I, I yeah, he's already done the it's it's all a dream once a season. I d- double down. It's 2024. That expired. That expired two two weeks ago. You yeah, can't do it's that. It's illegal. He can't. He literally can't. <laughs> He'll be arrested. America's sheriff won't put up with it. It's illegal. Yeah, but I feel you. Uh, There's sometimes some things on screen that I see that are so personally affecting, and I don't know if other people, um experience those scenes in the same way but just things that you know you have experience with or that are emotional triggers for you that man you just boy you really hate or love potentially a character in those scenes for it and yeah I, we I talked can see this me, being a huge trigger for a lot of people me and ron talked last episode about um you know this this whole deal and and um how kind of like uh, when you read the interviews with um, Juno Temple and, and how kind of respectful they were about shooting the violence towards her versus when she got her revenge on, you know, like they, they didn't show Roy beating her, but when she struck back and started choking the shit out of him, they put the camera back so you could see all the violence done to Roy. You didn't see any violence done to her. But I was watching with these last three episodes where they have the big, like, you know, you or someone you know is in domestic, and they got the hotline up. Mm-hmm. I'm like, God, I wonder what it's like to be a woman watching this. Is it do you? Is it just traumatic as fuck? Uh, is it empowering? Um, do, you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you get this? Is, is what Holly is trying to do, blunting the violence and, and maximizing the, one, the violence against the abuser? Is that reading, or is it just... Because, yeah, yeah I can't imagine being Haley things. here and, and having this be your job and then you're unwinding to watch your show and it's like just throw it right in your face. It's got to be it's got to be a lot. Yeah. It's probably both of those things at different times, right? When you're seeing yeah. the intense scenes of, of trauma and stress and violence, um, it's probably harrowing to watch. And then when you're seeing those characters get their comeuppance and when you're seeing dot yeah. be powerful and strong and brave you're probably cheering you know it's yeah. it's it's both of those things i i it'd be yeah like as uh you know dorothy become like a a mat what's the like um a champion you know like like women's like that's the they the the tried to consciously emulate her or, i don't know yeah, i don't know could could be uh but i feel for you there Haley. Um, let's move on to John G from Seattle says you guys have been mulling this over for a few weeks. So I thought I'd pipe in my read on why Indira stays or stayed with her worthless asshole. The husband is because of her sense of duty. The theme of this season, possibly the whole series is debt and all of its many forms. Duty is a form of this. It's something owed. We've seen this in the way Roy treats marital vows as an oath that he puts into his property, puts her into his property forever. As he explains the old, Old Munch. I think Indira is the opposite side of that same coin. She made vows to this man, and she feels obligated to stick to them, even though he's providing nothing and taking everything. She sticks to her vows, a sense of honor and duty, because to break it, regardless of how much we can see, uh, all see that she should, she owes this guy nothing. Her moral integrity is hers. That is until he literally breaks the vow himself. Being a man baby who wants a mommy for a wife is not breaking the vow, but cheating is. Now she can leave while remaining intact to her own internal moral code. I think this season is doing a lot of this both sides of the same coin stuff where nothing is on its own, good or bad, but it's how you interpret concepts like marriage vows, duty, debt, law and order, authority, etc. that matters. Um, I thought this was a great email, and it yeah, that is... I think is exactly what Holly is going for. It is as good of an explanation as I could certainly come up with. Um, she's law and order and until he broke the letter of the law you know which is the to not fuck other women i think that's one of the 
the the the rules at the top of the list uh she she has to stick with them because you know mm -hmm. her leaving him would be a bigger breach of her duty it's I, I don't agree with the analysis i mean i don't agree with her personal analysis there but like i do agree that's what they're going for with this character uh is this his physical therapist Yes, I do think this is his quote unquote so. physical therapist. Yeah. All right, let's move on to David, who says, I went back and watched the previous seasons in preparation to watch this season. I realized that Dot is the third, I think, female character to live in what might be considered total delusion. First was Kirsten Dunst, married to Fat Damon in season two. Second was Jesse Buckley, the nurse, in season four. What I find interesting is that unlike the other two Dots, or uh, unlike the other two, Dot's delusion is sympathetic. In all three cases, maybe self-delusion is a reaction to trauma. Dots is more obviously sympathetic, but delusional women seem to be another identifiable spice in the Noah Hawley Fargo stew. I wonder if it's just delusional women, though, because like I think um, I would describe William H. Macy's character, Jerry Lundegaard in the first Fargo, as delusional. Sure. I would I describe... Um... um uh, Freeman, what's this guy's Martin, name? Martin Freeman. Martin Freeman's character in the first season is pretty fucking delusional yeah. as this, the stuff goes. Um, I think I think people living del and, and acting delusionally is something that's kind of baked into, you know, like like normal people acting wa weird and delusional because of money, because the be wanting more than they've got and not being content. Mm goes all back to marge gunderson saying like look at what's all it's about money it's a beautiful day and you're killing people over money what the hell's wrong with you um yeah yeah uh christopher says i agree that lorraine lyon is a horrible person but i'm puzzled every time you criticize the debt collection industry more generally if lenders cannot collect on their debts either no one will lend credit to poor people or lenders will have to raise interest rates on people who pay them back including some poor people i'm just wondering what you envision as an alternative to debt collection i it's not that debt collection is necessarily wrong mm -hmm. unless you want to outlaw debt and that would really my understanding of economics would that would really handicap handicap the economy but you know we used to have debtors prisons where like you fell in a certain amount of debt and they just they just they just arrest you and throw you in prison until you could until you could quote unquote pay it back ha ha right I'm sure that encouraged some people to pay their debts right you know that probably had a you know a slight benefit towards people being afraid of being put in prison should we go back to that um, I I just think that like in my lifetime I've seen it's harder and harder to get bankrupt to declare bankruptcy. Um, there's some forms of debt you just can no longer discharge through bankruptcy, including, I think, in my lifetime, student loans and certain credit card debts. Um, it seemed, and, and like predatory things like payday lending, where they're lending you yeah. at 29.9% annual percentage, like the fact that they're selling cars. Oh, I mean, 29.9% is, is credit card rates at this point. Uh, if True, you want to talk right. about like payday loans, you're talking I don't know about what a payday loan is now. That was like to 20 the hundreds like, of percent. Yeah. So, like, I think that what I would say is that things have gone way too far on the debt collection side of things. They have they have com they completely eroded consumer protections. And also a lot of the debt collection is predatory on – they know that people cannot afford this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't care if you can't pay them back because they're going to make so much money on your interest rates that, like, by the time you foreclose on a credit card – they've probably gotten that and then some back from you. So it's like, I, I just think that the, there's, there's a balance between people just like taking free money and stealing it essentially and never paying anything back. And that's bad for society. And also um, people being so punitive that you destroy people's lives over forms of debt. And also the fact that you can get into debt for like medical things. Uh, the fact that right, we right. are the only advanced economy in the world out of like 35 countries that we classify as advanced uh, economies that do not have a form of uh you know socialized medicine to where you can't that can't happen um yeah like i, I and i and i think i think that, that, that yeah just the balance is way too far in the the hands of powerful rich people who are taking advantage of the system and it needs to come back our we the people's way a bit that's all 
Also, That's there's all. a distinction to be made between what you describe as lenders not being able to collect on their debts and buying debt for the explicit purpose of harassing people mm -hmm. um, into trying to get them to pay a, a dime on a dollar here. Because that's that's the more the more predatory stuff comes in, not with yeah. you know the banks that are lending out ten thousand dollar personal loans and people can't pay them back. It's the companies that go out there buy up this bad debt, um, and then begin harassing you, begin calling your parents, uh, begin calling your grandparents, your fa friends and family, b stalking you on social media, uh, tar trying to tarnish your reputation and essentially uh f blackmail you it's it's not it's not necessarily blackmail because they're extortion maybe um extort this money out of you i mean the the methodologies that they use are vile uh it's not necessarily like chase lends a bunch of money and can't get paid back on it it's companies designed yeah. explicitly to ruin people's lives enough that they'll pay money back yeah, and it's also it's unfair that like when these institutions get into trouble themselves and they've overextended themselves and they can't pay their back their bets, ah, oh, they get bailed out. But when the citizens do it, they have to go yeah. bankrupt and their lives are ruined. And there's also other dirty handed tricks they pit play. Like it's supposed to roll off your credit record after so time. So like if you have a rough patch, like uh, after eighteen months, after three years, after seven years, you're supposed to be able to recover when you get back on your feet. But these people that buy that bad debt love to like repost that stuff every thirty days, every ninety days. So like it never rolls off. And unless yeah, you Lorraine is not get a, a lender. Like don't forget who Lorraine is. Lorraine is not a lender. A Lorraine collector. is a debt collector. She buys debt and forces people to pay it back. Yeah. Like I said, there's there's a line. There's certainly a, people that take advantage of the system, um, always. But like, I, the, the more majority. I look at it, yeah, it's it's that's that's what people you know. Like right now, we're being told that there is like this wave of shoplifting that's just making businesses unable to operate in certain. But like, I also it's know amazing that those shop businesses are producing record profits every year. That's and, crazy. And to me. You, you look at you look at the shoplifting, the the shrink. Uh, it's a rounding error compared to like um, the 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 wage theft that goes on with these same companies, and it's not intentional. Mm -hmm. Like you got people actually stealing from the company versus accounting errors that cause employees to be underpaid, but it's still a a, a, a much bigger uh, imbalance going the way against the consumer and the employee versus the the company. So it's like I, I just think that the balance is way out of whack, and it's kind of wild to me and i'm not i'm not i'm not mad about it or anything but it's wild to me that people come out and defend the debt you know in 2024 debt collection uh like 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 you know hey aaron are you, you being too hard on <laughs> on the repo man here like, I don't know. Maybe maybe before I was born in the the 50s and 60s and 70s when we quote unquote had it good. Maybe maybe there's a lot of deadbeats out there taking advantage of the system and ruining these credit card companies and these debt collectors. But I don't think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. So that's 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 all I'm gonna say on that. All right. Let's go to Paul. It says I saw a thread on Reddit that I think identified a core point of the season five, and I haven't heard anything like it on your podcast so far. Basically, the idea is that Lorraine and Danish are meant to symbolize the neoconservative establishment. They're evil. They make their living through the exploitation of the masses, but they do it from an office and generally play by the rules, even if the, they've rigged those rules in their favor. In contrast, Roy and his operation embody MAGA slash the new right. He doesn't really have principles beyond I'm going to do things the way I think they should be done. Sure, he's religious, but do you think he really adheres to the turn the other cheek or other biblical messages like that? Um, and his brutality is much more personal and local. Him being involved in local law enforcement is even reflective of the way many of those types gain power through local elections to school boards and city councils and such. Danish built a career and a bunch of power off of becoming the best at playing the game. He dies because he doesn't realize that the new movement has no use or respect for the game. They only care about reaching their own ends and will use any means necessary to get them. Who cares if you're Gary Kasparov if your opponent is just going to flip the board over and punch you in the face instead of playing chess? That leads me to the audience's changing perception of Lorraine. As we see more and more of Roy, we find ourselves wanting to go back to the way things were when Lorraine was in charge. Yes, she's evil, but she's a known quantity and a relatively predictable status quo. 
Faced with Roy, or whatever MAGA politician you'd put in his place, many, right, uh, many might want to return to the old normal. I certainly know that I have heard plenty of liberal friends going, I hated Bush, but at least he never dot, 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 in response to Trump news. Yeah, it's a sense of, like, playing by the rules. Like, I don't like the way they played the game, but at least, you know, say what you will about Bill Belichick. He never pulled out a gun and shot anybody on the football field. Like, yeah, it would be worse if the, you know, from my perspective as a football fan, if the new coach of the Patriots started shooting the opposing team and mm-hmm. apparently and, and would get away with it, right? So, yeah, I this is the one I was alluding to in terms of, like, the Lorraine type of conservative versus the Roy type of conservative. I thought this was a great email that that gets the heart of the old guard, you know, the slideshow yeah. Bob type of, you know, uh, the cold-hearted Republican that lowers taxes, brutalizes criminals, and rules you like a king versus Roy, who's, like, actually ruling over people like a king unironically mm-hmm. not funny haha you know culture war is is actually becoming a war kind of there's there's definitely a difference and i i can i don't think it's crazy to pine for the days of bush jr and senior versus what we've got right now it would be nice to have um an opposition that plays plays by rules that, that, that you can understand and respect even if you don't agree with it that's the thing yeah it's uh, the shared version of uh they're, they're the shared idea that there is any objective reality uh, whatsoever mm-hmm. is is something that can at least anchor a, a discussion anchor a real debate of the issues but i don't know maybe, maybe it's like a a sickness you know there's a new sickness that we haven't encountered and we're just gonna have to develop the defense mechanisms to i think it just comes it down to like it seems like there's an evolutionary basis in whether you are a liberal or a conservative um and just broad you is know etched on your bones of, what are we talking about etched here? on your bones by god oh. and he blows your horn and then you're gay no he um he uh god what was i i got lost in the sauce here so I think I, I I believe I I don't give a fuck I I just I, 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 I this is my beliefs which apparently are sacrosanct in this is country sacrosanct in this country I believe there's an evolutionary component to to conservatism and liberalism I think that there there's something in your wiring that some of us monkeys are like fuck this is that let's why are we doing things this way let's change it and then there's another set of monkeys are like whoa 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 we've been doing this for a long time uh i'm not going to let you change something that's working for us and we through our various monkey means we fight about it and we come together and and we come with a new reality you know some some people want to pump the brakes on the people wanting to destroy systems they don't understand to change things and some people are wanting to charge ahead and change things I think you get things like the Civil War when you get the real loggerheads like hey we really think these people are people and not property, and you should let them all go, and the other side being like, well, they are our property, and they're worth a lot of money, and we don't want to let them go, and you exhaust the all the soapbox, like, what's that? Does a Frederick, was this a Frederick yeah. Doug, Douglass uh, uh, I don't know if it is, quote but... about, like, you've got, there's four boxes, the Defend Liberty soapbox, ballot box, jury box, ammo box, and, like, society, like, you, you kind of, like, Figure out the if the other side really gives a shit about this deep seated thing by pushing up against those various boxes, and you get to things like the Civil War back in the you know 1860s when you ran out of the the soap and the ballot and the jury, and the other side still wanting to fight, so you go to the ammo box. And I think that um, when you get these like really big, deep seated, deep felt divisions in society, that um, Sometimes, yeah, you gotta you gotta go to the mattresses. Whether that's politically, whether that's uh, through labor, um, through striking, general strikes, uh, whether it's through you know bombing uh, postal centers and burning down courthouses. I I, I don't know. Like I I don't like it, but it does seem like that's what happens. Like you you test against the other side. Like are they full of shit? Or are they really are they really willing to go? And then. Someone mm-hmm. blinks or they doesn't, and we're just in an era where we're really side deciding whether the other side's going to blink or not, and uh, mm-hmm. it's scary and it's uncomfortable. But uh, we we've been here before, and we'll probably be there again. So, yeah. Anyway, let's move on to Jordan D. Uh, so this is this is um, he wrote us earlier in the season. This is a guy who was an extra 
on Fargo. And it's unclear to me how much he wants me to talk about that because uh, I, I don't know they might get in trouble. I, I, there's a, someone else, another lady wrote us who apparently is the next door neighbor, or lives mm. on the same street that that Wayne and Dot Lion live. Okay, nice. Um, and she was like sending some behind the scenes, but um, but but uh, Jordan's got some other. I'm gonna leave all the what episode he's in and whether you can see him or not to decide. He can write in and let us know if he wants to talk about that because I guess he was in this episode and the la- and the the finale. But he also want to talk about something stuff that was not that. He says, John G. from Seattle's long email about debt tipped me off to something. First, I'm sure he's correct about Holly's message about debt being uh, that these promises Dot makes are some the same kind of debts that we should uh, make good on. Um, he, and you missed this, but uh, John G. sent his email about debt, and he talks about you know debt like in the ter- sense of Lorraine, and he talks about debt in the sense of like um, Dot being horrified that she's not there to make pancakes for her daughter because she promised. You mm. know, like debts of okay. love, obligations to your neighbor versus debts to some nameless corporation that might even be overseas. Um, he says it would make sense why pancakes have been featured in, I think, every episode. Um, especially, like he says, an example when Mama asks Old Munch what he wants, he commodically replies pancakes or that Dot orders pancakes in a truck stop and Linda... It's also pancakes that transfer her in and out of the dream state. Maybe I'm not right about there being pancakes in every episode, but they're weirdly front and center. And I noticed the last episode of the season is entitled Bisquick. I think John G is correct in this connection, and maybe pancakes symbolize Dorothy's love as being a sort of debt, as John G put it, a debt of love. Here's where I think things get really interesting. When John G made the connection to debt as a sort of love, I immediately thought of the verse in the Bible, Romans 13, 8, that says... Uh, oh, no one anything but a debt of love, for he who loves has fulfilled the whole law. Wouldn't that make a great message for this season of the show? It's counteractive, positive kind of debt that would disrupt the institutional or abusive ideas of debt that the villains are centered around. I can almost imagine the last scene of the show being Dot making Scotty pancakes, making good on her debt of love, and this verse coming on the screen. It continues to get interesting when you read the whole of uh, chapter of Romans 13. The first verse says, let anyone be subject, or I'm sorry, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I feel like Roy Tillman probably has this verse tattooed somewhere below his pierced nipples. Historically, it's one of the verses that has been taken out of context by real-world Roy's, the fundamentalist militant far-right Christians who, when government power is in their hands, use it as a threat that their authority is God's authority, that the word is God's word, when in reality it was written to people living in a political situation, the Roman Empire, that they had no democratic vote over or human rights within. They're doing their best at the bottom of a social ladder. The very next verse makes it clear the the authorities St. Paul has in mind are the authorities who are simply there to punish lawbreakers, and it's not referring to authorities who punish innocent people to do, uh, who do right. Of course, Roy Tillman's of the world read the first few lines from authority being given by God and stop there. I wonder if Holly read the whole chapter and is using the first few verses as part of Roy's motivations and the verse about the debt of love as part of Dorothy's motivations. Hmm. I think it's interesting that like guys like Roy will use Romans 13 to justify their power, but then wipe their ass with it when they're going against the authorities that, that, that they don't recognize. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Like they're, they're defining who are actual authorities. Um, yeah. Cause it's not yeah, and as, it's God, God, if God put that special agent in charge yes, in that position, then, then he's him. supposed to be there. Right. But that, that's <laughs> So reading this is kind of blowing my mind. I've, I've read the Bible multiple times when I was a child, uh, and I did not care what it had to say. Um, how how do the witnesses... So do a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians don't read the Bible totally, and also yeah. don't care what it had to say. <laughs> how do the witnesses interpret this verse? Because this verse is saying exactly the opposite of what the Jehovah's Witness organization does. What do you mean? I mean, they don't recognize the authority of... Of, they, they they say to be no part of the world, right? They, I mean, they recognize yeah. authority. It's like they pay their taxes and shit, but like, I don't think that they would say that the United States government is put in place by God. They, they certainly wouldn't. Absolutely not. It's something to be tolerated yeah. until 
the Great Tribulation. I think they so they try to drive the between the two towers of you know the authorities are put here by God and they bear the sword for a reason. So did you fear and respect them and the good Christians pay their taxes da da da. With also the pay Caesar things to Caesar and God's things mm-hmm. to God, where it's like. But these are the God's things. government. The government can ex- exert thor- authority over everything except for those ex- things expressly reserved by God, like witnesses. But if, if God they... is putting into place the people in authority, right. are they not part of paying God's things to God? It's true, but like, shouldn't it's like, they let's say be joining the, the army? And if the United States government said it's illegal to read the Bible, I think a real Christian would read the Bible still because that's an, sure that's an illegitimate use of the power like the the that's that's I would that'd, be the, so. C, that'd be caesar demanding god's things and they have no they don't have that authority but it's all but how do you justify not being not not working at the post office how do you justify not working at the post office or not voting if they say you're supposed to or i don't yeah like i mean it could be the jehovah's witnesses are cult could be no could, could be uh how dare you? <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I think so. I, I do really like this idea of like promises um, to people you love being a form of debt. Um, and, and yeah, that idea that like this is a positive form of debt, right? This is the thing that brings us closer, not uh, causes divisions between us. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I could totally see the end of this series um, or this season being dot making pancakes for her family or or what is um what is wayne's favorite shit the thing that like they went on their first date he had it and now he insists that it's his favorite thing his favorite meal it was a shepherd's pie shepherd's pie yeah yeah uh so maybe she makes pancakes for scotty and shepherd's pie for wayne <laughs> i don't know it's a weird it's meal paying her, but paying yeah. her debt of love mm-hmm. i like it all right, Joseph writes in and says, while watching the last episode, I found myself saying out loud, don't forget the gun, don't forget the gun, as Doc climbs down into the pit to hide. I complained about this pretty big oversight to my wife as Roy's men started making their way over to check the windmill, and she replied that it was sad that Dot's mistake came when she was trying to follow Indira's advice and run and hide, rather than following her own instincts to fight back, to be the for real tiger. Uh, I think the confident look that Dot had when Old Munch armed her and let her loose is a sign from the show that Dot forgetting the gun was not a convenient way to have her need to be saved, but rather the capable people like Dot have has shown to be make ca- uncharacteristic mistakes when they go against their nature. Interesting. I like this. I thought this was really good because I, it did make sense to me, like why she would leave the gun and take the bone. But it is in the contrast of like, a lion telling her to fight and then Indira who's many things, but she's not a lion or tiger. I don't think, uh, saying, Oh, fuck that. Belay that order. Go run and hide. So she's fighting her nature, which is why uh, she makes this definitely a more satisfying conclusion than she just forgot. Cause it was a high stress situation. Cause she's been yeah. in high stress situations, right? When someone's invading your home and rolling up in yeah. a truck with masks and baseball bats with nails in them and shit, that's a high stress situation and she performed admirably. So yeah. Yeah. I like that. The, the more poetic interpretation of that, her denying her own nature leads to her potential downfall here. And it's only uh, someone who knows her true nature stepping in and saying, you need to be this again. That saves her. Yeah. When a, when a fellow predator helps her out of that pit and says, you're free now, don't ever put yourself in this position again. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like, and I, yeah, I expect, I expect some fucking fireworks next week, man. It's <laughs> yeah, to, man. Uh, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, I, I do wonder. So let, let's, uh, before we take off, what, I want to gauge your feelings on this. Mm-hmm. Do you think we're going to see a large scale battle? Do we think it's like, do you think that uh, Roy's Patriots are going to come? Uh, do you think that there's going to be a full division of rifles that are going to come behind the FBI to... No, I think we're going to see a battle between Odin's crew and the the law enforcement there on scene. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think people are showing up. I, I don't think his think live so stream too. had much effect. I, I paused and read some, and there was a bunch of people. There were some people, you know, saying, yeah, I'm heading over. But there's a lot more people kind of like giving verbal, like, give him hell. Right. Roy. 
but not yeah. like I'm 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 heading there to put myself in harm way. It's a mo yeah. They're getting a lot of that. Yeah, like, oh, oh, or for real? You actually want me? It's it's, it's cold outside, and <laughs> man, it's like an eight hour drive. And gosh, you know, ah, oh. yeah. No, I I think we'll see we'll see a shootout, but it won't be a epic scale. It'll just be forty dudes versus law enforcement. Yeah, I wonder if they'll use the the whiteout effect again, so they can you know get away with having like a large like a eighty person gun battle, but you'll never see more than two or three people in a in a white against the white green screen. Yeah, which I think that's cool. That's like thing that only really Fargo can kind of do. Um, there's almost like supernatural storms that can brew up that kind of cause you know make. I, I expect like... there to be. Yeah, I, I'm with you. It's it's somewhat unique to this show and i like when they use it and they don't overuse it which i think is crucial um yes if every season ended with a big white out it might be kind of fun but it would also diminish the effect of it when it happens yeah. uh i think we might see some big fireworks like there there've mm -hmm. got to be explosives on this compound I assume booby traps. Yeah, some booby traps, some like home alone writ large. Yeah, i i think so. Yeah. I would expect there to McAllister be some anthro somewhere. Was a fifty-five-year-old sheriff with ant, yeah, with fertilizer and uh -huh. debt core and maybe some C four. Yeah, I could, I could see that for sure. Yeah, so maybe bigger than you know, would think, but smaller than you would think also. Do you think Roy's got the one escape tunnel, or do you think he's got like tunnels crisscrossing his property? Feels like this is the only one. Yeah, kind of. Although his houses are a little strange, right? Yeah, you, you he's see got Dorothy those... crawling through his weird Back hatches doors and, and closets secret passages and yeah so maybe I see some being some tricky stuff we'll see that's going to do it for this episode fargo at baldmove.com if you got some more email feedback to send us of course you could follow us on all of our social medias at baldmove except for tiktok we're at baldest move and we could use your support use <laughs> discount code mercado uh, on your subscription to Bald Move at support.baldmove.com to get five extra bug out buckets. Eat the food, <laughs> shit in them. They're by use. They're going quick. Hashtag Bacado at support.baldmove.com. That's it for us here at baldmove.com. We'll see you next week for those Tiger Base fireworks. Until then, I'm Aaron. And I'm Jim. See ya.